The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, very glad to have you with us. A nice show for you today. In about 15 minutes, we'll be joined by Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. iShares, of course, is the world's largest ETF provider. And Matt is a tremendous all-around resource on the bond market and in bond ETFs. We're going to cover quite a bit of ground with Matt today. We'll look at last week's Fed decision. We'll find out how Matt thinks investors should be approaching the bond market right now. And we'll also highlight several iShares bond ETFs. So again, we'll do that in about 15 minutes. Now, later in the show, Connor, you and I will have our usual weekly market update. And then we're also going to spotlight an iShares bond ETF, one that holds corporate bonds. So really, the name of the game for today's show is bonds, which may or may not always drive the same level of excitement as stocks, but they're certainly no less important when it comes to investor portfolios. Yeah, Nate, you, look, you don't often hear people trading bond tips at a cocktail party like you do the hot tech stock. You know, friends aren't bragging to each other about the great bond they bought, earning them a safe and reliable income stream. That that just doesn't happen. But Bonds are a very important of part of investors' portfolios, and we're going to dig into this less discussed and, frankly, underappreciated component of your portfolio today. We're, we're going to spend the, the whole show discussing bonds, and we're going to dig into the advantages of bond ETFs, the basics of why you should own bonds, and have a really in-depth conversation with Matt Tucker about the bond ETF universe and the role he sees bonds playing for investors. It's going to be a good show on an important topic. Yeah, and by the way, if you have questions or comments for us as we talk bonds today, you can visit ETFstore.com. You can find us on Twitter, or you can email us at advice at ETFstore.com. Let's first start today by explaining the rationale for even owning bonds in a portfolio, because I've come across investors from all walks of life, young, old, experienced, inexperienced, aggressive, and even more conservative investors who simply avoid bonds in their portfolios for a variety of reasons. We like to keep this very simple in terms of why you should consider bonds in your portfolio. We typically boil this down to three basic reasons. Number one, bonds serve as a ballast in a portfolio. They can help you weather a market downturn, just like the one we saw in January and February of this year when the S&P 500 was down over 10%. In aggregate, bonds were up a couple of percent. Bonds can be that counterbalance when there are negative moves in the stock market. So so that's number one. Number two, bonds are dry powder that you can put to work when there are opportunities in the market. Uh, Perhaps if you own some very conservative bonds in February, maybe you rebalanced. You sold some of those bonds and then bought some stocks at a 10% plus discount. Dry powder allows you to do that. It allows you to take advantage of opportunities. And then number three, income. Depending upon your situation, bonds can be a primary source for generating income in your portfolio. I think many investors associate bonds with income, and that's certainly a reason to own them. So, Connor, bonds are a ballast. Bonds can be used as dry powder, and then bonds can provide income. So let's walk through these these three items, Nate. In general, regarding the ballast or the safety aspect of bonds, we view fixed income or bonds as as the conservative part of our clients' portfolios. We don't think that is where you should be taking risk in your allocation. I mean, that's what stocks are for. And bonds are the perfect diversifiers for stock positions. You mentioned how well aggregate bonds have performed year-to-date with a 
you know, tumultuous first six weeks in the U.S. stock market, U.S. Treasuries actually have a negative correlation to U.S. stocks, meaning they move in opposite directions of each other. And that's exactly what you are looking for with diversification. And, and that's why you want to own bonds to help smooth out the ride of owning equities. And for investors looking for buying opportunities, bonds are a great place to keep dry powder, especially since cash isn't paying you anything to own it right now. During the volatility we saw in the first quarter of this year, moving funds from bonds to equities was something many of our clients did. And, you know, maybe for not as aggressive investors, you brought up the point, Nate, of, of simply rebalancing. Periodic and systematic rebalancing, moving funds from asset classes that are performing well to those that are not, is a key tenant of investing. And again, the start of this year was a great time for investors to rebalance their portfolios. And your point, you know, maybe more simply put, buy stocks at a you know eight to twelve percent discount, depending on when you might have done that in the, at the start of the year. And the final, most obvious reason people own bonds is for the stream of predictable income through bond interest or, or bond coupon payments. And this is an area where, frankly, some investors have gotten themselves in trouble recently. Because of the brutally low interest rate environment we've experienced over the past seven or eight years, nobody's making what they're used to making on their on their safe investments, right? Cash is paying nothing. CDs at the bank are paying nothing. You know, safe, short-term bonds are paying very little. And as a result, many investors and advisors left the traditional, more safe segments of the bond world – called investment-grade bonds, and ventured into high-yield, or what is also known as junk bonds. And, you know, this was an area of the bond world we simply never owned. It goes back to the first two points about us viewing bonds as a diversifier and dry powder. We don't think risk is where – bonds is where you take risk in your portfolio as an investor. And – you know, it, it, it's worked out well for our clients over the past year or so because we never had exposure to these junk bonds due to their high risk of default. And with the collapse of oil prices over the past year and a half and the resulting bankruptcies of these fracking and oil uh, shale oil firms here in the U.S., high-yield bonds were slaughtered. I mean, people experienced very large losses in this sector of the bond universe. And you know, a lot of advisors and, and investors who were looking for that extra bit of yield, you know, in their fixed income exposure were exposed to this high yield bond sector. And, you know, thankfully, we were not exposed to the losses experienced by a lot of these investors because, you know, the high yields make these areas attractive. But the risk wasn't something we felt should be in the fixed income or, you know, the ballast dry powder side of the portfolio. And that's what we view bonds as. Well, yeah. And I want to make another point about diversification. Uh, if you invest in high quality bonds and you aren't getting too carried away, chasing yield and taking on risk, bonds are excellent diversifiers. Even for younger investors, a small allocation of bonds can help smooth out the ride in your portfolio over the long run. And, and I think just generally help with investor behavior because you have a bit of a buffer in your portfolio. And if you have that buffer, maybe you're not as prone to uh, to react in a poor manner when the market is nosediving. Yeah, I get this question a lot from my younger, more aggressive clients. And it's this, you know, if I have a long time horizon, why do I own any bonds? And there have, there have been quite a bit of, of papers and research papers and studies on this. And it turns out that if you are in 90% equities and just 10% in investment grade bonds over the long term your return actually ends up being similar or almost the same to somebody who was exposed to 100% equities but you get a less bumpy smoother ride you know reduced volatility um during your path to that point. So, you know, it, it's really kind of a a win-win scenario with even younger aggressive investors to have a small sliver in investment-grade bonds. You're going to get the same return at the end of the day with a slightly more enjoyable ride. Yeah, you can end up with better risk-adjusted returns. Now, for most investors, there are three ways you can typically go about investing in bonds. You can buy individual bonds, 
You can buy bond mutual funds, or you can buy bond ETFs. And we're going to focus primarily on bond ETFs today. But I do think it's important to provide some basic points of comparison here. And a great place to start is with how you buy individual bonds versus bond ETFs. Connor, buying and selling individual bonds can be both expensive and a bit of a black box. There's no central exchange for bonds like we have with the stock market. That's an important point, and I think it's something that maybe a lot of investors aren't aware of, that every you know stock market, right, New York Stock Exchange being the most, most famous, is price discovery. At all times, anybody can get on to Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or whatever and find out exactly what any stock is trading for, what they could buy it or sell it for. Bonds, believe it or not, don't have that central marketplace. And with all the technology improving our lives today, it's hard to believe this. But brokers, if you if you want to buy or sell a bond, your broker literally has to get on the phone to talk to different bond traders to get the best offer for a particular bond. I mean, think about that. With all the technology in today's world and how easily we can track every equity and ETF we own, literally to the second Bonds don't have that option. It is a very large and opaque marketplace. And for bonds that maybe aren't traded that often, or if you're an investor and you have a smaller size bond you want to buy or sell, you are going to get hammered on your execution. And what and why that is is because bonds are usually traded in blocks of millions of dollars. I mean, large institutions, pensions, etc., are usually the ones trading these bonds. So it's very hard for the individual investor to get a fair price when you're trying to sell a twenty five, fifty, even hundred thousand dollar bond. You are gonna take it you know, take it in the teeth if you have to go buy, you know, sell that bond on the open market. Well compare that process you just walked through for individual bonds to bond ETFs. With bond ETFs, because they trade like stocks You can see the price of your bond ETF at any point in time during the trading day. ETFs make it very easy to buy and sell bonds. You have transparency in the process. You know exactly what you're paying for. And, you know, the other the other wonderful thing about this is you can make one trade to buy a bond ETF and then you can own an entire portfolio of bonds. It could be thousands of bonds all with a single trade. Think about an ETF like the iShares Core U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF. The ticker on that is AGG. And we'll talk about this in a moment with uh, Matt Tucker uh, of iShares. But this ETF owns nearly 5,500 bonds, and you can buy them all with a single trade during the day. And so outside of just the ease and transparency of buying these bonds, you also get diversification. Would you rather own, let's say, 10 or 15 individual bonds in your portfolio or 5,500? Well, there's a there's several different aspects of, of why owning your bonds through an ETF makes so much sense. I mean, the first is default risk. Now, if you own treasuries, this obviously doesn't matter. Still, you know, viewed as the safest investment on the planet. But even if you own investment grade corporate bonds or municipal bonds, imagine what happens if one of those bonds defaults. I mean, you could lose your entire investment in that bond, and to your point, Nate, you know, with a bond like AGG, you know, you end up, or an ETF like AGG, you end up owning, you know, thousands of bond issuers. But beyond the default risk, the homework you need to do to research bonds is extensive. The bond universe is actually much, much larger than the equity universe, and you have to look into the credit quality. The issuer, issuer you know, if it's a municipal bond or they general obligation, um, or not? How are they? How are they funding themselves? How are they going to pay you back? I mean, it takes a full time research team to fully vet even one segment of the bond universe. I mean, it's hard enough for you know funds to do this well. Imagine trying to do this on your own. And in addition to the research challenges and the bankruptcy risk of owning individual bonds, we talked about this briefly. Getting a fair price when you want to buy or sell an individual bond is very very difficult as an individual investor. So again, with a bond ETF like AGG, you mitigate all three of those factors. You're going to get institutional execution. You're going to get diversification, reduced default risk, and you know the, the, the frankly impossible research challenge facing an individual investor buying bonds is all mitigated. Well, something else too with buying and selling individual bonds that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle is the interest they pay can't be reinvested. 
You, you can reinvest the interest you receive from the bonds in your bond ETF into more bond ETF shares, but you can't buy fractional individual bonds. So that's just another potential benefit of ETFs. But if you compare investing uh, in bond ETFs to investing in individual bonds, you have the ease of buying and selling with ETFs. You have the transparency of that process with ETFs. You have the diversification. And another thing we should point out is the cost of using bond ETFs. If you do your homework, there are no shortage of ETFs out there that offer very low-cost exposure to many different areas of the bond market. Uh, The iShares aggregate bond ETF I mentioned earlier, that costs 0.08% or $0.80 for every $1,000 invested. And I know we were talking bond ETFs versus individual bonds here, but compare the cost of bond ETFs to actively manage bond mutual funds, because there can be some rather big differences. So bond ETFs not only offer some potential advantages over buying individual bonds, but also bond mutual funds. So when we're talking about the bond mutual fund world, you have to discuss PIMCO total return. You know, Bill Gross's former flagship fund and certainly the most popular bond mutual fund of the past decade or more, that fund, the the institutional share class, so the the least expensive share class of that fund, costs 0.46% per year. Compare that to the eight basis points or 0.08% it costs annually to own AGG. That's almost six times as expensive, and that is so important in today's low interest rate environment that we're all facing. And, Nate, another, you know, a lot of proactive management people claim that bonds is the perfect market segment for active management. Again, because it's so large and, frankly, very opaque, right, that that an active manager who knows what he's doing can really show outperformance in that segment. The problem is the numbers don't bear it out. You know, my, my certainly favorite semi-annual report I ever get, the SPIVA scorecard, we, we discuss it on the show, you know, twice a year when it's released. It has some pretty compelling figures on the lack of mutual fund returns for bond investors. So looking back at last year, 2015, the intermediate term investment grade bond category is, is certainly one of the most popular, widely used uh, bond categories for investors. of active mutual funds miss their benchmark in that sector. 94%. And when you look at short-term investment-grade bonds, only slightly better. 74% missed. I mean, those are brutally tough odds that are stacked against you as a mutual fund bond investor if you're looking for at least just market performance in two of the large, largest segments of the bond universe in 2015. And the numbers play, play it out. You can look back one, three, five, ten years. It is very, very difficult for these bond mutual fund managers to even perform to their benchmark um, in this category because it is so difficult for them to overcome their fees. Well, yeah, and if you're comparing bond ETFs to bond mutual funds outside of just cost and performance, You also have greater tax efficiency with the ETF structure. Uh, You can buy and sell ETF shares during the day. You can't do that with mutual funds where you have to wait until the end of the day to buy and sell shares. And you have greater transparency and that ETFs report their holdings every single day. Mutual funds only do so quarterly. So bond ETFs offer an excellent way to invest in bonds. As we mentioned earlier, we do think there are several very important reasons for most people to own bonds in a portfolio. And if you're going to do so, bond ETFs offer a a compelling option. All right, we need to take a break. But when we come back, we'll be joined by Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. We'll talk Fed. We'll discuss how you might think about risk in the bond portion of your portfolio. And we'll, of course, highlight several iShares bond ETFs. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. The U.S. economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace, yet many Americans don't understand the parameters of this competition. Why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives? The simple answer is nobody ever taught them. 
The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet Stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell brand of products anywhere in the United States. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy along with Connor Kelly in studio. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. Of course, iShares is the world's largest ETF provider. They offer over 80 ETFs just on the bond side of the equation, and they have some 325 ETFs overall. Matt, as always, great to have you on the program. Hey, good morning, Nate. Thanks for having me. Well, Matt, before we get into bonds and bond ETFs today, I thought a good starting point might be to briefly touch on last week's Fed meeting because the Fed has certainly impacted the way investors have approached the bond market over the past several years. Did anything stand out to you from the Fed statement, and uh, what do you expect to see moving forward? Well, I think that the the meeting and the statement went pretty much as investors expected. You know, the Fed for a long time had interest rates at zero. They raised rates for the first time in a while this past December. And I think investors have been looking for the next Fed move. And the Fed's been, you know, they've been patient. They've indicated they're going to be patient. They're going to evaluate the data. They're going to look at growth, look at inflation. And it wasn't going to be a move in April. Um, It's probably not a move in June. Um, And if you believe the, the futures markets, investors are expecting the Fed not to move until later this year, probably around December. So I think investors should expect the Fed's going to continue to communicate and to be slow and steady, and that barring a real big pickup in growth or inflation, they're probably going to sit tight with where rates are right now. All right, man, if you look at where bond ETF investors have been placing their money recently, they've been moving out of treasuries and into riskier parts of the bond market, uh, investment-grade corporate bonds, high yield, emerging market debt. I'm curious, what do you make of this, and how does this maybe square with what we've seen out of the Fed recently? Well, I think it's been interesting. You've really seen a tale of two very distinct markets so far in 2016. So if you think about the first six weeks of the year, uh, we had a period of real risk off. You know, Investors were very concerned about global growth. They were concerned about what's happening in global equity markets. You saw money coming out of pretty much any risky asset. So that includes you know, high-yield bond funds. That includes emerging market bonds. It includes equities. You saw money coming out of ETFs, out of mutual funds. And a lot of that money ended up in very safe asset classes classes like U.S. Treasuries. And that was really the tone to the first call it six weeks to around February 11th. And then you saw this change in sentiment. You saw oil rebound. You had some, some noises out of the Fed. They were a little more constructive on growth. And you've seen this amazing risk on rally over the past, you know, call it two months now, where money has been, as you said, coming out of U.S. Treasuries and going into other parts of the market. And the way I think about this generally is investors have become comfortable again taking risk in fixed income. 
and that means taking credit risk through things like investment-grade corporate bonds or high yield, and it also means taking risk in terms of interest rate risk by buying longer duration, longer maturity funds, and being comfortable that the Fed is you know, probably on hold and we probably are not going to see <clears throat> a spike in inflation that might hurt those longer maturity assets. Well, Matt, for the average investor out there, how do you think they should be approaching bonds in their portfolio, just at a high level? Because Connor and I talked in the first segment about how we tend to view bonds as more of a ballast in a portfolio, not necessarily a place to load up on risk. But it's certainly clear some investors are moving towards riskier areas of the bond market, like high yield and emerging market debt. I think that's been a trend in place for several years now. Should investors use bonds for stability? Uh, should they pursue risk? Is it both? How, how do you view this, and how should investors balance risk and reward when it comes to bonds? Yeah, and you know, I think this is the key question. You know, I think if you think about how a lot of investors look at their portfolios, and even in fixed income, I think the biggest mistake people make is that they overmanage them. You know, so if I think about the fixed income portfolio, and we're out talking to investors, talking to advisors, overwhelmingly the majority of people say the role of fixed income in their portfolio is, as you said, ballast or diversification against equities. And if that's your goal, you don't want to take a ton of risk, right? You shouldn't be chasing yield. You probably don't want to be very tactical. Um, you know, I, I think that the most prudent path for most investors who really want fixed income to play that role of the anchor, you want a diversified portfolio of fixed income. If we want to own some credit risk, you know, some corporate bonds in there, uh, municipals, if you were a taxable investor, you, wanted, you do want to have some interest rate risk, you know, um, because that actually helps give you that balance against, uh, against equities. And so you want a diversified fixed income portfolio, and then you probably want to leave it alone for the most part. You know, um, I, I think that fixed income really does its best job when you're not trying to time the markets, which is incredibly hard. And for most investors, they are best served over the long term by building a nice, stable, core fixed income portfolio and just letting it do its work. Again, we're visiting with Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. Matt, regardless of whether investors take a more conservative approach to bonds or, or a riskier approach, there is, a, of course, no shortage of ETFs to help. And earlier, Connor and I touched on what we believe are some of the key potential benefits of investing in bond ETFs versus individual bonds. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Why do you think bond ETFs might be a better way to go for investors? Well, I think there's some real challenges that most investors face if you want to invest in the bond market directly. So if you think about the experience of, you know, average investor goes to the broker, goes to try to buy a bond, A, there's no exchange to look for your bonds, right? So it's like, well, so how do I find out what's available? You see a list of bonds probably on your online site or from your broker. You're not quite sure if those are the right bonds or the wrong bonds. It's hard to do research on them. And when you get a price for them, you're not really sure if that's a good price or a bad price, right? You often get just one price from one broker or dealer, and it was one one a good price. I, I don't know. I don't have nothing to compare it to, right? So um, with an ETF, you actually, these things trade on a two-way market on the exchange that looks just like a stock exchange, right? So I can see the ETF, where I can buy it, where I can sell it. I know the transaction cost I'm paying. So that's like kind of the first big difference for me is that the way you would just, in, just really uh, engage that market and the way you invest in the market is much easier and more accessible with the bond ETF market than it is for bonds. Second big thing is diversification. If you're out buying bonds, especially, say, corporate bonds, you don't want one or two or even four or five. You want diversification. So by buying a fund like an ETF, you can access to hundreds or thousands of bonds with one trade, which I think is a really important part of risk management um, in a portfolio. And the third thing, this is really important, is, you know, costs tend to be fairly low in bond ETFs. You know, um, look at the really big funds. I'll take AGG, which is our, our core Barclays Aggregate Fund. It's got an eight basis point management fee. Um, and that's a really low fee compared to most other fund options out in the market. And so you, you have an investment that is diversified, that's not going to cost you a lot in terms of you know, transaction cost or fees, and where you can actually go buy it, put it in your portfolio, and actually then keep an eye on it every day, which I think is really important. All right, Matt, if we can, I'd like to just briefly touch on three of the more popular bond ETFs offered by iShares. And I thought we'd start with an ETF you just mentioned, the iShares Core U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF, ticker AGG. Uh, can you just tell us what this ETF holds and, and maybe where it might fit in an investor's portfolio? Sure. So, so AGG is the ticker. So it's the iShares Core U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF. Um, it holds investment-grade bonds issued in the U.S., so think of it as it's kind of people call it kind of the S&P 500 of the bond market. It's your big diversified benchmark. Um, we typically see this sitting at the core of someone's portfolio. It's basically kind of that, that core piece of your portfolio. You build everything else around. 
And, you know, AGG is a fund. It is the world's largest bond ETF with about $35 billion in assets and actually one of the oldest ones in the market. It was launched back in 03. So this is really, I, I think of it as like this is just kind of bread and butter. If you're building a portfolio, a great place to start, a great place to kind of begin that portfolio build. And then you can kind of add on other pieces around it depending upon, you know, your risk tolerance and your investment goals. Okay, the next ETF I have is the iShares Tips Bond ETF, ticker TIP. This owns Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Should investors be considering inflation protection now, and, and how can TIP help? Well, you know, it, it, TIP is really interesting. So if you think about uh, tip securities, these are bonds issued by the Treasury, and what's different about them is the Treasury actually compensates you as a bondholder for increases in inflation. So you're, you're getting your coupon every six months if you hold a tip security, and then as inflation increases, you actually get more income, and you actually get more money back at maturity. So it's actually really the only investment out there that actually pays you directly for inflation. We talk a lot about inflation hedges like gold and real estate and things like that, but TIP's the only security that actually just gives you cash for inflation. There's no correlation to worry about. You get paid for it. So a fund like TIP invests in the broad U.S. Treasury TIPS market. Um, so for an investor who's looking to build in some protection against inflation or some diversification you know, in their portfolio, I think it has a role. You know, it's probably the kind of investment you probably don't see more than you know, maybe 5 to 15% in a, in a portfolio. Um, I don't think you want to you know, put a lot of money into it, but I think for that investor who's looking at inflation, we've seen CPI start to firm over the last couple months, and you think, well, you know what, inflation could be on the upswing. This is a way to provide some protection in your portfolio against that potential increase in inflation. Okay, then lastly, uh, the iShares floating rate bond ETF, ticker FLOT, this holds investment-grade floating rate notes. Uh, Can you briefly describe what these are and then where this ETF might fit in a portfolio? Yeah, yeah. so FLOT um, is a fund, as you mentioned, that invests in floating rate investment-grade securities. Um, A lot of investors, when they hear floating rate, they think about bank loans. Um, Bank loans are high-yield securities, so much riskier investors. FLOT, all the bonds come from investment-grade companies, so the kind of typical, you know, high-quality companies you might expect to see a, a bond issue from. But these bond issues just happen to pay a coupon whose interest rate is tied to a short-term rates, basically a three-month LIBOR. So all that means is that as short-term interest rates increase, let's say the Fed is raising short-term rates, if those rates were to rise, you would see the coupons on float increase. And if the Fed were to cut rates and rates, short rates were to move down, you'd see those coupons decrease. So it tracks that if you look at the, the coupons on the, these bonds historically, they've tracked very closely to where the Fed is and, and where the Fed sets the Fed funds rate. So in terms of role in the portfolio, um, we really see, I see kind of two things, uh, two potentials here. So one is that if you are an investor who is concerned about rising interest rates, concerned about the f- about, you know, say, longer maturity bonds. This could be a way to hold some corporate bonds and yet not take as much interest rate risk or, you know, duration risk in your portfolio. The second thing is that this is one of the ways an investor could actually participate in a Fed increase. So if you think the Fed is going to be more aggressive and out there really pushing rates higher and you own FLOT, what what you're going to see is you're going to see its distributions are going to increase as the Fed is raising rates. It can be a way to actually kind of ride the Fed move up. Now, it, it, tactically, I, I don't feel like this is really the market right now where something like float makes a lot of sense for the more tactical investor. Just because, as I mentioned, I don't think the Fed move is imminent. Um, I think this could be a, a very interesting play as we move later in the year and as we get closer to Fed action. But I think that at this point, given that we're probably you know six months or so away from the Fed doing anything at, at the earliest, this may be the best place to go right now, but it's something to think about down the road. Well, Matt, we'll have to leave it there. As always, fantastic insight into the bond market. Uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us on the program today. Uh, thank you. Hey, thanks, Nate. That was Matt Tucker, head of iShares Fixed Income Strategy. You can learn all about the iShares lineup of bond ETFs by visiting iShares.com. And I would also mention that Matt authors an excellent blog on different bond topics. You can find that at BlackRockBlog.com. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. And later, we'll spotlight an iShares corporate bond ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. 
Business disputes are rarely just about money. Oftentimes, they involve a breach of trust or a fundamental disagreement about the terms or operation of the business. The law firm of Graves Garrett offers comprehensive and creative solutions to these types of complex legal problems. Graves Garrett represents businesses and individuals nationwide in commercial litigation, white-collar criminal defense litigation, and compliance and internal investigations. If you're involved in a critical legal dispute, let Graves Garrett be your voice. Visit GravesGarrett.com or call 816-256-3181. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. You stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J-Girl Media. J-Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J-Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgirlmedia.com today. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Hi, this is Ryan Wiebe, owner of First Mortgage Solutions. If you've heard news lately about low interest rates and want to know if now is the time to buy a new home or even refinance the one you've got, give one of my experienced loan consultants a call at 816-778-7000. If you're too busy to call right now, just go to firstmortgagekc.com and fill out a full online application. Last year, we saved our average refinance customer over $457 a month on their monthly bills. First Mortgage Solutions, 816-778-7000. The Weeby Group, LLC, Kansas License, MC0025009, Equal Housing Lender. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Stocks were down last week. Both the S&P 500 and Dow Jones Industrial Average were down one and a quarter percent. And the NASDAQ was down 3% for the week. I also wanted to mention that gold was up nearly 5% last week. It is now up over 20% year to date. Gold continues to have a stellar year, and we'll touch on gold uh, in just a moment. Connor, the markets were disappointed last week with the Bank of Japan. They were hoping for additional stimulus, uh, as if negative interest rates and printing trillions of yen uh, are are just not enough. Mm -hmm. But the market was hoping for more. They didn't get it. And the yen has continued to rise and, and hurt large Japanese exporters. We covered this a little bit on, on last week's show. Year to date, the iShares MSCI Japan ETF is down nearly 6%. And the Wisdom Tree Currency Hedge Japan ETF is down 18%. Uh, but the reason to keep an eye on uh, on Japan and, and, and what's happening with the yen is Japan is the world's third largest economy. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the 
the only difference really between those two ETS performance is the strengthening yen. I mean, it's been that big of a move. And look, it's it's concerning. I mean, especially considering all the stimulus the Bank of Japan is using to try to, you know, uh, basically um, increase uh, exports and get some inflation going and devalue the yen. It's not happening. The yen is moving the other way. And you know, you're right. Because Japan is the third largest economy, a strengthening yen makes their exports more expensive to the rest of the world. And if the third largest economy slows down even further, that can certainly have global ramifications. And, and last week, the, the, the lack of additional measures by the Bank of Japan certainly weighed heavily on, on the Japanese stock market as well as global equities. And as a result of the lack of action by the by the BOJ. The yen right now is at a year and a half high versus the dollar. And last week had its strongest back-to-back days of gains versus the U.S. dollar since the financial crisis. This is not what the Bank of Japan wants to happen. But it remains to be seen you know, what, if anything, the BOJ can do to help weaken the yen again or at least stop the trend of strengthening. They are in a very difficult situation right now. When you talk about the impact on on something like stocks, I mentioned gold earlier. Gold has been moving higher as the dollar has been moving lower. Gold is now right around $1,300 an ounce. It's up over 20% year to date. And it's really been a combination of the dollar moving lower versus currencies like the yen. And then gold functioning as a safe haven with all the volatility we've seen in the stock market so far this year, it's been a classic example of why you may want to own at least a little bit of gold in your portfolio. Right. Gold tends to move opposite of the dollar. And with the dollar weakening versus most currencies recently, gold has responded, as you'd expect, very well. And you throw in the continued concerns about global growth, unprecedented central bank policies, plus the always present geopolitical concerns. And Gold is also showing some of its worth as a store of value in times of crisis. So there's there's certainly been some impressive outperformance compared to the major equity and bond asset classes year-to-date by gold. Well, we're not uh, big advocates of tactically trying to, to, to buy and sell gold. But, you know, we focused on bonds today and, and the role that those have in diversifying your portfolio. Gold can play a similar role. It's just one of those investments that can zig while other types of investments zag. And so if you have a little gold in your portfolio, as we've seen this move up 20% year to date, boy, that can add a, a nice a, a nice boost to your portfolio. It's portfolio insurance. And we've spent some segments of the show on it before. But you know, we, we, we view co- gold as a core satellite holding for almost all investors. And we've owned it for several years. And while it didn't do much over the past couple of years while equities were moving higher, uh, you know, this – year-to-date is exactly why you want to own it. And then lastly here, we need to have a break, uh, but yesterday was the first trading day of the month of May, and we talk about this every single year, but I feel compelled to mention it again. There's an old adage on Wall Street that you should sell in May and go away because historically the period between May and the end of September has delivered far lower stock returns in the time period between October through April. Two very quick points here, and I only mention this because the media loves to take this adage and and just run with it. First, historically, the time period between May and September, it has delivered lower returns in the period between October through April. But guess what? The returns between May and September are still positive. It's not like stocks decline 10% on average during this time. So just keep that in mind. There are still positive returns on average from May through September. And, And then two... There are plenty of examples of excellent returns from May through September. And the key here is I don't think you want to be in the business of trying to time which May through September period will underperform in any given year. You know, Connor, I think to sum this up, this is a nice little saying. It's catchy. It gets attention. Sometimes maybe it works. But this is something I think investors should really just ignore. Again, we're only discussing this because – it, it's it's a catchy thing that most media outlets, frankly, do pick up and discuss. So we do feel like while most investors don't pay heed to, you know, cliches like this, some might. And <laughs> it's funny because you're, you still make money historically in this time period. It's just less than the rest of the year. 
But when you're looking at your other options of cash, CDs, bonds, I mean, what else are you going to do, right? I mean, the stock market is still historically positive, and it's just, again, it's something for, frankly, the, these news organizations and media outlets just fill a couple minutes with. There's there's nothing really substantial behind it that any serious investor would consider. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll spotlight an iShares corporate bond ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapist, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at MyMassageBliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. We're always on the hunt for game changers. The iPhone, Uber, Airbnb, all revolutionary market leaders. In the financial world, the exchange-traded fund is the game changer, growing at a record pace by cutting the cost of mutual funds and helping you keep what you've worked so hard to earn. At the ETF Store, we utilize the latest technology to help you create a balanced portfolio you can monitor and, most importantly, understand. Call us today for a free consultation. 816-363-ETFS or go to ETFstore.com. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode, so give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. For many, owning a home is the American dream. And at Stonegate Mortgage, we play an important role in helping you achieve that dream. So whether you're buying a new home or refinancing your existing one, choose a company that puts a face and a firm handshake behind every deal. The American dream lives on at Stonegate Mortgage. Call Tim Noyce, 913-717-4111. Stonegate Mortgage Corporation, NMLS number 186732. Tim Noyce, NMLS number 415086. Stonegate Mortgage is not licensed to originate loans in Hawaii and New York. Equal housing lender. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF Store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature Racing and Connor Kelly in studio. Let's spotlight an ETF. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF Store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,800 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all, so you don't have to. 
The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the iShares iBox Investment Grade Corporate Bond ETF. The ticker symbol on that is LQD. This owns over 1,500 U.S. corporate bonds. These are all higher quality investment grade bonds. They have an average credit rating of single A. The average maturity of these bonds is about 12 years with top issuers including J.P. Morgan, Verizon, Goldman Sachs, AT&T, and Bank of America. Financial service companies actually represent nearly 30% of LQD's holdings, with consumer non-cyclicals and communication companies making up another 30%. The expense ratio on this ETF is 0.15%. It's currently yielding about 3.3%. And I should note, this is the most popular corporate bond ETF on the market You know, Connor, we talked earlier about how we think it's important for investors not to get too risky in their bond portfolio. I view this ETF as a nice way to maybe take on some moderate risk. Corporate bonds are certainly going to be riskier than U.S. Treasury bonds, but you're not making a move too far out on the risk spectrum like you would if you were investing in uh, you know, junk bonds. And corporate bonds can offer a decent yield, 3.3% in this case. So an ETF like LQD is really a nice balance. And that's the challenge for fixed income investors in today's world. What's that balance between how much risk you take to generate you know, a decent yield. And and this fund could provide, you know, a nice portion of that well-allocated fixed income part of your portfolio. I mean, obviously, investment grade bonds are slightly more risky than U.S. Treasuries, but you're getting paid for that additional risk. Nearly an extra one and a half percent over comparable 10-year Treasuries in this case. The biggest risk, I think, for this fund is interest rate risk. What happens to the value of the underlying bonds in this ETF if rates go up. This ETF has a duration of over 8. What that means is a 1% rise in rates could theoretically result in an 8% decline in the value of the underlying bonds or the the fund itself. Though that would only happen if, you know, happens all at once, right? A full 1% raise is extremely unlikely. And also, LQD and any other bond ETF would be adding new bonds at these higher at these higher rates. I mean, eventually you will start enjoying the coupon yield, the interest payments from increasing rates. Of, of course, because these are investment grade bonds, but at the lower end of investment grade, being the average, you know, uh, credit quality of single A, there is risk. Obviously, if the economy went in the tank and some of these account these companies began experiencing some financial distress. But again, that's why you own a well-diversified ETF that owns thousands of issuers. And while you're not trying to pick individual bonds, you, you, can, you can substantially mitigate that default risk. So the decision you need to make in your bond allocation is, first, how to own them through an ETF, through a mutual fund, or individually. You know, we obviously have our opinions on this, right? And we spent most of this show discussing the positives of ETFs versus those other options. Um, but once you know the vehicle, then the the job is to come up with a well-allocated balance. That's the key word with fixed income, I think, that we arrived to today. And I thought Matt Tucker had some great advice when you said, you know, what is the biggest mistake he sees investors making in, in fixed income? And, and he said over management. You know, you need a well-diversified you know, um, exposure in your fixed income of treasuries, corporates, maybe munis in a taxable account, some interest rate risk like like LQD that does, does provide you a decent yield, has some decent duration, and then, frankly, leave it alone. And that's what most investors aren't doing. They're trying to time the market, and that is an extremely difficult thing to do. Well, two other quick things I'd mention on LQD, really just adding on what you talked about. When you look at the risks of these investment-grade corporate bonds, I think we should point out the default risk is still very, very low in these bonds. So you hit on the main the main issue, which is going to be that interest rate risk in, in the fund. And I do think an important point to, to make is if you have a longer-term time horizon, as interest rates rise, like you said, the the ETF, the fund in this case, is going to be adding new bonds at those higher rates. Right. So if you're holding for the long term, there's a crossover where 
the additional yield you're getting compensates you for uh, for any principal lost in the short term. Uh, that being said, we should note that iShares also offers an interest rate hedge version of LQD. The iShares interest rate hedge corporate bond ETF, the ticker on that is LQDH. So if you want to minimize the interest rate risk that you were just uh, talking about and, and, and you just want to have that credit exposure, you can do that through this ETF. It's really just another tool in the toolbox. You can get pretty creative with, with bonds using ETFs. Uh, so, again, the ticker symbol uh, on that ETF is the iShares iBox Investment Grade Corporate Bond ETF. Uh, sorry, ticker symbol LQD. Uh, in investing in bond ETFs versus individual bonds, just keep in mind you have the ease and transparency of buying and selling. You have that diversification, and you can get exposure uh, at a much lower cost. All right, we'll have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. I want to thank iShares Matt Tucker for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Matt. And don't forget, you can listen to any of our guest interviews by visiting our ETF Expert Corner at ETFstore.com. Full podcasts of the ETF Store show are also available at ETFstore.com and also Apple iTunes and Google Play. Check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Next week, we'll welcome Meb Faber onto the program. He's co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambry Investment Management. They offer a lineup of ETFs, but we're going to focus the majority of our time discussing Meb's new book. It's called Invest with a House. It covers cloning successful investment managers. You'll want to join us for this conversation. Meb is just a tremendous investing resource. So again, he'll be on the show next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Until then, have a great week, everyone. 